Welcome to the new chapter of uh, our spread charts app tutorial. And in this chapter, I will go through specific charts one by one and explain uh, what you see on those charts and how these charts are useful in the analysis of uh, commodity markets. As I told you in uh, one of the previous chapters of uh, this tutorial, uh, the selection of uh, charts uh, in the action select uh, depends on the input, uh, which means that you will have a slightly different selection for outright futures or Intel delivery spreads uh, and so on. Uh, that's the reason why I have uh, prepared uh, four tabs uh, that will help me uh, demonstrate uh, different types of charts for different underlyings. Uh, the first tab is for outright futures where I picked uh, December futures contract on corn. The second tab is for inter-delivery spread or calendar spread. Uh, here I have uh, the widest uh, possible uh, spread uh, within a single crop uh, on corn, of course. It's uh, July, uh, long July 2022 and short uh, December 2021. The third tab is for uh, a continuous contract. Uh, I sticked with grain, so here's the first continuous contract uh, on corn. And the final, uh, the fourth tab is uh, for the ratio between uh, continuous contracts. Of course, there is more uh, possible combinations like the spread of continuous contracts, like, uh, I don't know, intermarket spreads and so on, uh, various uh, uh, multilex spreads. Uh, so... I'm, it's not. Uh, I, I do not have an ambition to go through all these combinations because otherwise uh, uh, this uh, chapter would be too long. But I think uh, this is uh, the main. Uh, these are the main category categories of uh, uh, the possible inputs. So if you uh, will understand uh, these uh, uh, these charts. I think you will be able to go through the rest uh, on your own. Nevertheless, the number of combination of charts uh, will be uh, quite large, even for these uh, four tabs, even, even for these four possibilities. And that's the reason why uh, this chapter will be probably quite long. Uh, so I recommend you to use the uh, sub chapters or the chapters inside the uh, Vimeo video. Uh, where you can jump from uh, one part of the video video uh, till the other. I will start with uh, the most simple option with the basic price chart. So let's go to our first tab to the outright futures and pick uh, the price. You can see that all the individual charts are grouped uh, into three or actually four but the fourth category is not available for this input into a few categories uh, price term structure and commitments of traders as i said we are interested in a price chart so i will uh, roll out uh, the first group and select the price and uh, volume uh, once i do then you can see the chart uh, button will uh, become or became green uh, which is a good sign that uh, we have entered a valid input and selected a compatible chart so i can just click on the button and the chart will simply appear I will hide the left menu for a better view of the chart and also uh, make it a bit larger. And I think the chart is uh, rather uh, self-explanatory. Uh, it's a basic uh, open, high, low, close uh, candlesticks chart. Uh, each candle represents a single day. Uh, maybe uh, I would uh, mention that the close is not uh, closed in a strict sense. Rather, it's, uh, it's a settlement price, uh, which is uh, important, especially for spreads. Uh, 
Uh, but uh, for liquid commodities, there's basically no difference uh, between the close and settlement price or very tiny, like a tick. Uh, so uh, you can consider them to be the same on such a liquid contract as uh, this one. Uh, below on the bottom subchart uh, is uh, the volume, uh, which are these uh, gray columns. And the prior day open interest, uh, which is this uh, blue curve. If we uh, zoom out uh, and select a uh, higher, a uh, longer period, the chart will uh, aggregate into weekly candles, as you can see here on the uh, five year history. Or if we go even further and uh, well, I forgot that we are uh, displaying uh, an individual contract that uh, has a uh, limited time of life, uh, usually a few years, uh, like uh, three years, uh, as we can see here. So uh, the highest uh, possible uh, zoom is the five-year option. Uh, Anyway, I think that's uh, all for this particular chart. So let's switch to the second tab, which is uh, this interdelivery or calendar spread, and select the price. The name of the of the chart is slightly different. And by the way, you can see we have four groups here, but uh, we will get to them later. So let's uh, uh, open the first group and pick uh, the price and underlines uh, and click on the green uh, chart button again. I will make the chart larger again. And you can clearly notice that the chart looks different. Uh, first of all, it's a line chart, not a candlesticks chart. The reason is that uh, if you want to make a price or a chart that displays a price of some spread, you have to use the settlement prices. That's the only uh, correct option. You cannot use uh, the open high and low, well, especially the high and low prices, because there is no guarantee that the high, the daily high on one contract, uh, corresponds in time to uh, the high on the second contract. Uh, these highs can be uh, or can happen in different in different times. So you cannot uh, uh, make a, uh, a chart, you cannot make a spread out of the high and low uh, prices. So the only correct way is to use the settlement prices, uh, which is also what we do. And that's the reason why you see just a simple line chart, because it's just a difference between the settlement prices of the July contract and the settlement prices of the December 21 contract. In any case, uh, I would say that uh, the open high and low prices are not important at all for uh, the spreads because uh, the curve is uh, noisy on its own and adding uh, additional prices would uh, make it only worse. Moreover, uh, these spreads are usually uh, medium to longer term opportunities, uh, especially the spreads on physical commodities, and that's uh, which which are the strategies that uh, our software is focused on, and that's the reason why uh, the settlement prices are uh, totally sufficient for this type of analysis. But let's get back to the chart. Uh, once again, you can use the uh, buttons on the right to zoom in or zoom out, or you can use uh, your mouse uh, if you are on a desktop PC. If you are on a mobile device, uh, such as iPad, uh, which uh, has a touch, touch screen, uh, then you can just uh, uh, tap on the chart, and then you can use your finger to drag it and uh, uh, swipe to the left or right and move the chart, the selected window to the right or to the left, uh, which is uh, quite a familiar gesture on touchscreen devices. 
If you are a keen observer, you might have uh, noticed a few differences uh, between this chart and the previous one. Uh, the first difference is that uh, there is no volume or open interest uh, subchart here. And the reason is that uh, we could have easily added even here, but uh, you have two contracts or even more if you uh, chart a multilex spread. And uh, either we would have to make the subchart uh, larger so that uh, all these curves uh, have enough space, which on the other hand would make the primary chart too small. Or uh, we would stick with uh, the same size of this uh, subchart, but I would say that uh, it wouldn't be much readable given the higher number of uh, open interest and uh, volume uh, time series. Therefore, uh, we created a dedicated chart, a dedicated type of chart, uh, which is intended for liquidity analysis on spreads. And I will show you this chart uh, later in this chapter. The name of the chart uh, hints about the second difference uh, compared to the chart for an outright futures contract. Because uh, the chart is called price and underlyings, which uh, suggests that there is more than just the price uh, here. And that's true, because if you uh, look into the legend, you will see more time series here. And these time series are hidden by default, but you can simply uh, show them by clicking on the gray square. For example, here we can display the price of the underlying, which is always the nearest contract out of the interdelivery spread, even if it is uh, a multilex spread. Uh, in this case, it's the December 2021 contract. So it's uh, this uh, proper curve. Uh, this is very helpful because uh, you can analyze the behavior of the underlying together with the spread. I very often use it on energy markets. It's a very powerful tool for spotting divergences between the uh, spreads, between the calendar spreads and the market itself. So uh, I really recommend you using this tool. Uh, of course, uh, the price uh, or the prices have different scales, otherwise it would not be possible to display them together, which means that uh, the right axis corresponds to the spread and the left axis uh, belongs uh, to the underlying, to the uh, purple curve. But uh, it is not just the underlying that you can display here. There is also the full carry uh, time series, uh, which is uh, an important metric associated with the commodity, uh, specifically uh, this spread on this commodity. And uh, it's the maximum uh, costs associated with uh, holding the commodity uh, by taking delivery of of uh, the nearer contract and uh, uh, delivering the commodity by the expiration of the more distant contract. It's based on a theoretical model, our own model, and we're using data from and the specifications from the exchange. It's an advanced stuff uh, and uh, it's a, it is not a topic of uh, this uh, tutorial. Uh, but we will also get to these charts uh, later, uh, maybe near the end of uh, this video, because there is more, not just this uh, simple curve. I would just say uh, it is an arbitrage level that uh, the bear spread uh, should not exceed under normal market circumstances. In fact, it should not even touch uh, the green line. The only thing it can do is to approach it uh, into some degree. Uh, of course, there are some special cases, uh, especially when the 
physical market uh, disconnects uh, with uh, the paper uh, futures market when uh, wild things can happen and these uh, fundamental levels stop working uh, but as i said uh, this happens uh, or this these situations are very rare but it's time to move on and uh, take a look at uh, continuous contracts However, uh, before I show you the price of uh, some continuous contract, I will make a small detour and uh, jump straight to the term structure chart. And the reason is that uh, to fully understand the continuous contracts and the price of continuous contracts, uh, it's necessary to get uh, the term structure and fully understand the structure of uh, uh, futures markets. So I will display this, uh, I will select this option, it's the only option under the term structure group. And in fact, uh, this chart is the same no matter what is the input uh, in the first field. Uh, whether you enter an outright futures inter-delivery spread or anything else, uh, the uh, chart will look the same. And uh, here it is. Uh, this is the term structure for uh, corn. In fact, it's not the entire st uh, term structure uh, because uh, it's uh, just the uh, two years from now uh, till the future. So if I zoom out, you will see uh, the full term structure on corn. So what is on this chart? Well, physical commodities uh, trade uh, through the so-called futures contracts. Uh, each dot on this chart represents uh, a single uh, futures contract, uh, uh, specifically a price of this contract at a given day, which in this case is uh, July uh, 23rd. Uh, in other terms, uh, it's also called uh, the state of the market because you can see all the prices, I mean the prices of all the active futures contracts at a given day. But what is uh, a futures contract? Well, the futures contract is an agreement to uh, buy or deliver some amount of physical commodity uh, at uh, a predefined day in the future. And that day is the expiration day. Uh, as I told you uh, at the beginning of this chapter, uh, each contract uh, usually exists uh, for a few years and uh, once it expires, it uh, ceases to exist. And uh, if you are long the contract, which means that if you buy a futures contract, you promise to deliver a certain amount of the commodity at the expiration day. But uh, do not worry about uh, delivering uh, tons of corn, in this case, uh, to the exchange. Uh, if you get rid of the contract well before expiration, which is a typical thing uh, that uh, speculators do, uh, you have no obligation to deliver anything. And if you do not uh, sell the contract on your own, your broker will automatically liquidate the contract uh, uh, for you. Uh, so uh, this is true for all speculators and for all retail brokers uh, only if you are a hedger or a farmer or you know a company or individual dealing with the physical commodity and have the right broker then you will be allowed to take physical delivery but if you are a speculator uh, it never basically it never happens uh, unless someone goes uh, something goes terribly wrong uh, and if you sell the contract, which means that you are on the other side of the trade, you promise to deliver a certain amount of commodity to the exchange. But once again, uh, the mechanism is the same. If you get rid of the contract before expiration, you have no obligation to deliver anything. 
Now that you understand uh, the expiration process, uh, it will be easy to explain this chart. These dots are individual futures contracts, individual expirations. Uh, the right axis is the price. Uh, also, the numbers uh, above these dots are prices of all these futures contracts that are valid uh, at a given point in time, which in this case is uh, on July 23rd, 2021. That's the reason why this chart, the term structure chart, is sometimes called the state of the market, because it shows the state of uh, the market in a given commodity at some point in time which means that the bottom axis is not a history it's not a time series chart like, like you saw on the previous two uh, tabs uh, this axis or the, the dates on this uh, bottom axis are from the future at least from my point of view when I'm doing this video uh, that means these are the expiration dates one advantage of uh, our chart is that uh, in other platforms it's usually uh, common to align those dots, uh, those contracts, at each month. Uh, however, in our case uh, you can see that uh, there is a specific date on the, on the axis, on the bottom axis. So these dots are precisely aligned at specific uh, expiration dates with a daily precision. Uh, that's also the reason that uh, when you hover around these dots, you can see uh, not just the ticker of uh, the contract uh, and the price, uh, but also uh, the expiration or the time to expiration in days. Uh, so you can see, for example, that the current front contract, uh, which is the September expiration, uh, expires in 53 days. Uh, maybe it seems to be just a detail, but there are some commodities like, for example, crude oil and, crude oil and other uh, energy markets when uh, the expiration month is uh, different than the actual expiration date. I mean that the expiration occurs in a different month than, uh, it, than the expiration month. It's slightly odd, but uh, that's how it works in the energy market. So that's the reason why this is uh, very helpful and you will get the expiration uh, with uh, high precision. The bottom subchart uh, shows uh, open interest and volume for each of these contracts on July 23rd. You can also hide uh, either open interest or volume or whatever you wish so you can get just the quantity you are interested in but it's a quick way how to uh, recognize the liquid contracts or compare the liquidity of these uh, contracts uh, against each other uh, so that's uh, the chart itself but uh, that's not all because uh, uh, you can see that there are some hidden time series in the legend and these are very helpful in this case. The first three curves uh, show how the term structure looked a week, uh, sorry, a day ago, a week ago, and a month ago, which is very helpful if you want to compare uh, the historical state of the market uh, with uh, the current one. Uh, however, the most interesting curves are these uh, three. Uh, these are the term structure averages and they show the average term structure over, over the past 5, 15 and 30 years at this part of the year. That's important because, uh, for example, in case of the five-year average, we did not take uh, five years of all the historical data for all the historical term structures, which is well over 1,000 curves. No, we took just five curves. We selected the curves on July 23rd over the previous five years 
and made an average, a simple average out of them. It is important because uh, the shape of the curve on physical commodities is uh, widely different uh, over the year. For example, the curve will look much different when corn is close to the harvest or after the harvest than, for example, uh, in spring. Or uh, the shape of the curve on natural gas in winter when there is a lot of heating demand uh, for the nearest contracts is uh, totally different than the curve uh, in the off-season. So that's the reason why it is critical to use just the same dates uh, over the previous 5, 15 or 30 years. Of course, if some of those uh, days uh, uh, happens to be uh, on a weekend, then we use the Friday's curve. Uh, one or two days doesn't really matter in this calculation. The point is that uh, it's in the same part of the year on the same date. And that's not all. Uh, you can zoom the curve using the buttons, but uh, it works slightly different than uh, on the price charts. Here, the last year, two years or five years are not uh, uh, at the end of the chart like in the price charts, but it's at the beginning of the chart because usually you want to see uh, at the beginning, uh, you want to see the beginning of the curve and the most distant contracts are uh, not as important to you because they are usually uh, illiquid as you can see here the volume is uh, basically zero uh, so that's why it's uh, different than on the price charts uh, and now uh, let's assume that uh, you would like to see historical term structure because as I said uh, term structure is always for a single point in time, in this case uh, July 23rd, but uh, you would like to see the yesterday's or uh, yesterday's term structure or the term structure a week ago and so on. Of course, you can use uh, these uh, historical hidden time series, but uh, let's say that you want to see term structure three days ago, which is not uh, here. The option is not here. Uh, there are two ways to do that. The first one is to use this slider above the chart, which is uh, this uh, blue strip. You can just drag uh, this uh, circle and swipe it to the left. And you can see how the term structure is animating, which is uh, quite fun. <laughs> uh, you can see how the contracts uh, were moving over the uh, past month or so. Uh, if we go from uh, the history uh, to the present, you can see how the curve is gradually moving to the left and uh, the left contract suddenly disappeared. Uh, which is correct, because that was the expiration of that contract. So I think it's also quite educational and it will help you to understand the uh, state of the market and the structure of the futures market. Uh, as I said, uh, roughly more than a month is avail available uh, using the slider. But let's say that you want to see a deeper history. For example, um, term structure on corn uh, five or ten years ago. No problem. As we explained in uh, one of the previous chapters of this tutorial, uh, we use the tools button to hide less used tools that the tools that you will use less frequently so in order uh, not to clutter the, the general input uh, that you will use daily we decided to hide them in this uh, hidden menu so when you click on the tools in this case you will see a new field uh, it is actually calendar field the date is the same as uh, the date you see here in the legend and if you click on the field, you can pick a specific date and uh, you are not restricted just to the previous month. You can go uh, to the history or jump uh, over the years, even zoom out and select, I don't know, in the 
1984, let's pick May and the middle of May 1984. And if you click uh, at the chart button, you can see the turn structure on May 16th, 1984. So that's very easy to uh, visualize the state of the market deep in the history with spread charts. Uh, all the historical data uh, is available to you. Once again, this is not something you will use on a daily basis, but uh, in case you want to study some historical data, it is there. I guess uh, that's all about the turn structure chart. Uh, just to remind you, it doesn't matter what you enter into the input field, the chart will look the same. Uh, even if I enter a specific futures contract, uh, I can do a turn structure chart and uh, it will look uh, exactly the same, of course, uh, when I go back uh, into the present. Uh, so I will do so to prove my point. Uh, and by the way, if you pick a random date uh, from the future, the app will just show you the last valid uh, uh, term structure. Uh, so as you will see, these two charts are exactly the same. Actually, there is a tiny difference, uh, which is uh, this red colored price above uh, the first contract. Because here you can see it's above the second contract. Uh, it's there to help you recognize uh, what contract have you entered. In case of the first continuous contract, it's, of course, the first contract. Uh, but in this case, uh, the December expiration is currently this one. I would say it's even helpful when you do term structure chart using uh, a spread such as this one, inter-delivery spread, of course. As I said, the chart itself uh, will look the same. The only difference is that this time there are two red colored prices uh, and all of them uh, are associated with the contracts you entered here, which is July 2022 and December 2021. So it's uh, just uh, a minor improvement to help you recognize uh, those contracts, Im immediately recognize those contracts on the uh, term structure chart. Uh, when you try to do a turn structure in this case, when you have contracts for two different commodities, no matter if they are continuous contracts or outright futures contracts, uh, there is only one turn structure chart. So you will uh, have an option to select either term structure for corn or term structure for soybeans. And I guess that's uh, finally all about the term structure chart. And now let's get back to price charts and uh, I will show you the price of a continuous contract that will be easy to understand uh, given the fact that now you are familiar with uh, the term structure chart. So here we are. Uh, this is the first continuous contract of corn. Unlike the outright futures, uh, that uh, is basically three years of data. Uh, this time it's 50 years of data. And uh, the only way uh, to make such a chart is to uh, assemble individual contracts uh, together to create such a long time series, which means you cannot trade uh, a continuous contract. It is an artificial contract. Uh, so that's the reason how it is possible to create such a long history of data. Of course, uh, you can zoom in using the buttons on the right uh, or your mouse if you are on a desktop PC. Uh, on two year uh, period or shorter, the chart will show you uh, daily candles. Uh, uh, and if you pick uh, roughly five year uh, period, then you will see weekly candlesticks. And finally, uh, roughly around 20 years and above, you will see monthly candlesticks, the monthly time frame. Uh, so the chart automatically, automatically uh, aggregates the prices on higher time frames. 
uh, maybe that's all about the chart itself well I forgot one important thing uh, you already noticed this third field on the top which specifies the role methodology the way how the individual contracts are connected together to create uh, such a long time series the first and the default option is by expiration or uh, on the last trading day it means that uh, contracts are connected together once uh, the previous one expires for example we have the first continuous contract on corn on this chart that means uh, i guess there will be turn structure somewhere around here that means currently the first contract is uh, september 2021 so for now uh, this price or these candles belong to the september expiration once this contract uh, expires uh, it will switch to the next in line which will be december expiration because at that time it will be the first expiration and so on and on so that's the way to create the first continuous contract uh, rolling on the last uh, trading day the second option is by maximum open interest and it's very simple uh, you just select always select uh, the contract with the highest open interest at a given day at a given time uh, because we have the first continuous contract if we have the second continuous contract then it will be the contract with the second highest open interest at a given day uh, so I think it's uh, pretty straightforward but I would say you want to know uh, when to use uh, each of these options well personally I prefer to use the raw methodology by maximum open interest when I analyze the price of some commodity like for example corn here uh, because I want to use the most liquid contract and the open interest is a great way to measure liquidity on uh, on each contract for example here we have uh, the price of some specific futures contract in this case it's uh, December 2021 and you can see that uh, the open interest uh, the blue curve is uh, very low at first but it tends to increase as the contract uh, becomes liquid usually when uh, it has uh, less than one year till expiration but uh, once it uh, moves too close to the expiration the open interest uh, starts to move lower which is not the case uh, in, in, in the, which, not, which is not the case uh, for this contract just yet but uh, it will start to drop once uh, we are closer to December and uh, at that point uh, the app will just switch to the next more liquid contract so uh, that's my setup for uh, price action or technical analysis of uh, uh, some individual commodity nevertheless uh, there are a few exceptions uh, the problem is that uh, not all the commodities have all the expiration amounts uh, liquid enough uh, to trade uh, on corn all the expirations are liquid of course not these uh, very distant ones but uh, once they become closer to the expiration uh, usually when they have less than one year till expiration they will be liquid too but there are some commodities uh, especially metals like silver for example where uh, some of the expiration amounts are not liquid at all even when they are close to expiration here you can see for example the august expiration on silver that is quite a liquid it's just a matter of preference because uh, historically there were just some expirations on silver and uh, traders are used to them but uh, subsequently the exchange added new expiration months uh, to increase uh, the range of contracts or uh, the traders are uh, able to trade but uh, 
you know, they, the traders don't like these new expirations that are used to the old ones. And that's the reason why they remain illiquid uh, even when they are close to the expiration. The point is that it doesn't really matter uh, what role methodology you choose on corn. Uh, so the chart looks nice even when I use uh, the roll methodology on the last trading day. Uh, of course, the chart looks slightly different uh, near the end. That's because of the uh, increased volatility. But most, most of the time, uh, these two charts will look rather similar. Not on silver. Uh, when I show you the first continuous contract on silver, uh, rolled by expiration, the chart itself looks rather ugly. Uh, there are periods when the candles are not uh, truly candles, but just these uh, uh, horizontal lines. And uh, it just looks odd. And the reason is that uh, even those uh, illiquid contracts contracts are plucked into the uh, continuous contract and that creates these periods of illiquidity that just looks weird. However, when you switch to the uh, second option to roll uh, by maximum open interest, the chart will suddenly uh, look very nice as you are used to. Of course, uh, there are some exceptions to this rule. For example, on interest rates, uh, it's uh, not wise to use uh, this roll method. Instead, it's necessary to use the first option, the uh, roll method by expiration, because, uh, for example, on euro dollar futures, even some long dated expirations have higher liquidity than the closer ones and you know it creates some weird effects there but i won't delve into these details the point is when you analyze uh, the price of some commodity uh, the best uh, role methodology is usually by maximum open interest on the other hand when i analyze uh, some structural uh, indicators like uh, continuous contango or some ratios, I usually uh, pick the first option on last trading day because, uh, for example, when I do the Contango analysis, I definitely want the first contract to be the first contract on the term structure. So uh, that's just it. <laughs> uh, now let's uh, switch to the fourth uh, tab, which is the ratio of continuous contracts. And uh, let's show the price for this ratio. It will look slightly different because uh, once again it is a line chart and the reason is the same it was with uh, with the spreads because no matter if you do the spread of uh, specific contracts or a spread or ratio which is just a different kind of spread made out of uh, continuous contracts you have to use the settlement prices, the open high, and uh, the, the open high low close. Uh, sorry, the high and low, and even the open price into some degree are not useful, and it's outright prohibited to use the uh, low and high prices because uh, there is no guarantee these prices are synchronized in time uh, between those two contracts. So. That's the reason why uh, it is a line chart. However, when you zoom out uh, to the uh, to the five year period, it will uh, switch to the weekly candles. But the candles themselves are made out of this uh, line chart. So uh, that's the weekly time frame. Each candle represents a single week. When you zoom out even further, you will get to the monthly time frame where each candle corresponds to a single month. Otherwise, uh, it works the same as uh, the simple uh, continuous contracts. Uh, you can uh, pick the raw methodology, but in this case, I prefer to use uh, the first option on the last trading day. Uh, so. I think uh, that's all for uh, continuous contracts and we can move, uh, finally move to the other types of charts.
So let's move back to the first tab and uh, I will talk about the seasonality charts. I will intentionally skip the continuous price and continuous histogram because these are some of the uh, most advanced analyses uh, in our software and I will uh, left them uh, till the end of this video where uh, it will be appropriate to uh, delve into these two charts. Uh, on the other hand, seasonality charts are pretty simple. Uh, moreover, it's something uh, you will be probably using quite often because uh, it's a popular tool, easy to understand. So let's start with uh, the stacked seasonality chart for December contract uh, on corn. Here's the chart. Uh, I think uh, the explanation is pretty straightforward. There are 10 curves uh, on this chart. Uh, the blue one is the current contract. Uh, it's the one you entered uh, into the input field. Uh, and the others are the past expirations. And you can see that uh, they have uh, the expiration month, the same expiration month, but the year is different so it's always December but it's uh, December 2020 1918 and so on so these are the past expirations and uh, they are aligned in a way that uh, the month and the day on the x-axis uh, on the bottom axis uh, are the same which means that uh, these years are stacked on top of each other so that you can compare the seasonal moves uh, uh, in each part of the year. And by the way, uh, the bottom axis uh, corresponds to the current year, to the blue curve. Therefore, uh, there have to be some minor uh, interpolations over the weekends for the past historical uh, curves, because sometimes uh, the prices just uh, uh, fall into weekend this year. Mm, that's also the reason why uh, if you uh, take a look at these prices, you will see values like uh, 0 0.83 uh, or, I don't know, 0 0.92, which uh, are not passable in, in corn. The lowest uh, tick, the lowest increment, the tick value is 0 0.25. So only multiples of uh, 0 0.25 are passable. But uh, these, uh, you know, imprecisions are not uh, relevant uh, on this chart, it doesn't really matter. Uh, otherwise, uh, and that's one of the greatest advantages uh, of this chart, otherwise you see the prices as they were back then if we omit the interpolations. That means uh, this is probably not the first chart uh, you will begin your uh, seasonal analysis with. The reason is uh, obvious on a first side because it's not so easy to uh, get the prevailing seasonal trend uh, over a particular period. Even if we hide some outliers, which is easy to do like uh, on any of our chart by clicking uh, on these squares in the legend, uh, that makes it easier. So we can now see that there is a prevailing Dow trend uh, over this period. But still, uh, the chart is rather cluttered and uh, it takes uh, a moment to, you know, get the prevailing trend. On the other hand, it's the best uh, chart if you want, if you already have an idea about the upcoming seasonal trend and you want to take a look at the details, specifically the outliers. If you want to see how the prices uh, behaved when the seasonal outlook failed, like uh, this uh, blue year, uh, which is a, a good example that uh, the seasonal trend is just some tendency of the price to do something. It's not a rule. So uh, this is the main purpose of this chart, basically. And by the way, uh, the chart looks the same 
even for inter-delivery spreads uh, or any spreads for that matter. So let's show stacked seasonal chart, stacked seasonal chart for uh, this inter-delivery spread between July 22 and December 21. I think uh, it's clear how to use the chart. Uh, it looks similar to the outright futures, uh, just the opposite because it's a bear spread. You can hide the individual uh, years even here. So it's basically the same. So let's uh, move to the second chart, the second seasonal chart, which in fact will be probably the one you will start your seasonal analysis with. And the chart is called uh, seasonality or seasonal averages, uh, basically the average seasonality, uh, call it whatever you want. But uh, I guess uh, this chart will be very easy to use to you. It's uh, pretty simple. It's uh, not cluttered as the previous one. Uh, here are the three uh, seasonal curves. Uh, the five year, which is red, 15 year, which is green, and 30 year, which is uh, the yellow curve. And uh, it's very easy to get the prevailing uh, seasonal trend on this chart. For example, now you can see that uh, we are in a seasonal downtrend because uh, all the curves are heading down uh, since the middle of June till roughly the, uh, the beginning of uh, October. So uh, it's really simple, really straightforward. It's easy to analyze, uh, you know, many commodities quickly. The, I mean, the seasonality uh, trend on many commodities uh, using this chart. Uh, so that's a huge advantage of this study. You are probably interested uh, to know how the curves, the seasonal curves, are calculated. While I've been calling these curves so the seasonal averages, and even the name of the chart itself is uh, average seasonality, uh, these are not simple arithmetic averages. The calculation is more complex, so I think I have to explain it now. Uh, Let's say that uh, we want to calculate the 15-year average. In that case, uh, we take uh, the prices of the previous 15 years and we weight each uh, year according to its volatility and only then calculate uh, the average. But it's not all. Uh, once we have the average, uh, we uh, stretch or squeeze uh, the curve based on some recent volatility of the current year. Uh, the intention is to match the current uh, year as much as possible. But it's not all, because we also need to shift the resulting curve up or down so that uh, the match uh, is uh, the best as possible. Uh, because the purpose of this analysis is to show you the prevailing trend. That means that the averages, the values of these averages are not relevant at all. That's also the reason why you won't see any values when you uh, hover over these curves, unlike uh, the current year. Uh, the uh, vertical axis corresponds to the current year not the averages. Uh, their absolute values don't make any sense at all. So please uh, don't send us emails uh, that you calculated the simple average on your own and it should be positioned differently on the chart. The absolute values don't make any, don't make any sense because the averages, the seasonal curves, are stretched uh, or squeezed and moved up or down to match, uh, to match the current year. There are some hidden uh, time series, even on this chart, uh, which are these, uh, you know, colored channels. Uh, their purpose is to visualize the dispersion of uh, the seasonality over uh, different periods. 
To be honest, I forgot <laughs> the exact calculation because we changed it many times. And personally, I don't use uh, these uh, color channels anymore. So maybe we will discontinue them in the future. Uh, nevertheless, they are still here. Uh, they can be helpful to highlight the period of increased uh, volatility and uh, decreased volatility on the other hand so use them at your own will but uh, personally i don't use them at all and once again uh, the seasonal averages for spreads uh, look the same uh, here's the proof the chart is basically the same uh, of course the curves uh, look different because uh, the input is different but uh, mm, the style and uh, the curves in the legend, they are all the same. So I think there is no need to explain this. And let's move to the final seasonal chart. The chart is called uh, seasonality by month, but I never use it uh, alone and always use it together with the seasonal averages. Therefore, I will, I will make this uh, chart somewhat smaller and open the new chart as uh, an additional subchart and I will pick the same uh, ex uh, same the same contract and select seasonality by month and uh, here is the chart it looks like a stepwise chart uh, because uh, the values uh, don't change uh, over uh, the course of uh, the entire month. Uh, that's intentional because uh, there is in fact a single value for each month and each uh, curve. And the explanation uh, will be pretty straightforward, especially if you uh, read the description in the legend. It shows the percentage of the time that uh, the price of the contract you entered increased uh, over a given month. For example, we take the price of the contract at the beginning of June and at the end of June, compare these two and uh, uh, decide whether it uh, went up or went down. And then the algorithm uh, do this for each of uh, the previous 5, 15 or 30 years. So, for example, uh, you can see that uh, the price uh, increased in exactly a third of the time over the past 15 and also 30 years. That means uh, it uh, went up uh, in 5 over the last uh, 15 years and in 10 over the past 30 years. The 50 uh, percentage line is the key level because it divides the situation when uh, the price of the contract uh, uh, increased more often rather than decreased over the previous 5, 15 or uh, 30 years. Personally, I tend to think about this chart as some kind of a seasonal breath analysis, similar to the breath on the stock market, uh, uh, where, the, where you analyze the number of stocks that uh, went down or went up over uh, the given, on the given day. So it uh, doesn't matter how much, each individual stock uh, went up or went down just the numbers and here it is the same it doesn't really matter if the price increased by 10 percent or 150 percent in a given year it always count uh, just as a single instance of uh, increasing price in a given month and then you analyze the number of instances uh, that uh, the price increased uh, in that month. So it serves as a sort of a confirmation for the seasonal curves above. So I use it as uh, an additional uh, analysis, additional data to confirm or disapprove my uh, seasonal outlook. I usually hide the five-year uh, curve because 
there's not just not enough data for the statistics to be reliable. I use the five-year curve here on the averages because it serves me as an indicator of uh, a changing trend of the market or changing situation, fundamental situation of the market. For example, when uh, the five-year curve uh, behaves uh, very differently to the 15 and 30-year curves, that means that uh, the previous five years were not uh, the usual price action you see on that commodity. And then me that means there's uh, probably some fundamental change on the market, a new technology or new way to extract the commodity and so on. And that tells me to be very careful about uh, the seasonal outlook because it might not work uh, as usual. But... Uh, in the statistics below, I would say the five-year curve is uh, not as useful uh, as uh, the seasonal curve above. So therefore, I uh, hide it uh, usually when I open this chart. Nevertheless, uh, the use case is pretty obvious. You can analyze the number of times uh, that the price uh, uh, moved up or declined over uh, the uh, period specified by each month. For example, here we can, we can see that July is uh, historically one of the worst months uh, for corn, uh, which is also visible on the averages, but even the statistics is uh, really bad. It is also quite helpful in uh, the situations when the averages uh, go uh, rather sideways, like for example the 15-year average year over the course of September. But below you can see that despite the sideways action, uh, the price eventually ended higher in 60% uh, of the cases, which is quite a lot. So that tells me that uh, despite the neutral uh, seasonal outlook based on the seasonal curve, there is a, a slightly uh, bullish uh, bias uh, in September. I will not uh, lose time with uh, showing the chart for inter-delivery spreads because once again, it is exactly or it works exactly the same as here. There is uh, basically no difference. So I think we are ready to conclude the seasonal charts and move on. There is one last thing I have to explain regarding seasonality. We receive many questions about the reason why there is no seasonal analysis for continuous contracts uh, or the spreads or ratios of uh, seasonal contracts. And the reason is very simple. Uh, it is intentional. While we are open to feedback and suggestions from our users, we will never add uh, something to the app that uh, we know that uh, simply doesn't work. And that's the case with uh, the seasonal analysis for continuous contracts. Of course, uh, you can find it in uh, other platforms and it would be quite easy for us to add it uh, even here. But the point is that when you do a seasonal analysis on physical commodities, you have to use specific contracts or specific spreads. It's... Uh, really the wrong thing to do to make the analysis using the continuous contracts. And the reason is very simple. On physical commodities, there can be stark differences between the behavior of individual contracts. For example, the natural gas in winter, I mean the winter expirations can behave very different compared to the off-season expirations or uh, we already mentioned the corn that uh, it can behave differently or I mean the expirations uh, around the harvest can behave differently than the spring expirations and so on. So whenever you do a seasonal analysis you have to do it on the contract you are intending to trade. Otherwise the results of your analysis 
will not be truly relevant uh, for the opportunity you are analyzing. And that's the reason why we will never add seasonal analysis of continuous contracts because continuous contracts are assembled out of many individual expirations across the whole year. And now we are ready to move to another group of charts uh, that will be commitments of traders analysis. So once again, I will show you the usual setup I'm using for commitments of traders analysis, which is the one where I have uh, the price of uh, the commodity or the underlying in the top subchart and the commitment commitments of traders data in the bottom subchart. So I will start obviously with the most simple chart, which is uh, the chart of net positions. Uh, here it is. I will zoom it out uh, as much as possible. And uh, what is the commitments of traders data? Well, it's a sentiment analysis, uh, but a pretty good one. Unlike Paul's, uh, here you can see what the largest players in the market are exactly doing with their positions, how they are moving their money out and into the market. And uh, this information is invaluable. The commitments of traders' data is one of the reasons why I like commodities so much. There is nothing like this uh, on the stock market. Of course, there are many uh, sentiment surveys and polls, but uh, that's not the same. I used to say that there is a democracy in the markets, just a slightly different kind of democracy. Instead of uh, each man having a single vote, it is that uh, each dollar uh, has a single vote. Therefore, a trader or an institution with uh, millions of dollars will have uh, a much greater say in the market uh, compared to a retail trader with uh, thousands of dollars. And that's exactly what the commitments of traders' data can reveal to us, the positions of the largest players in the markets. The COT data is published for each commodity. Therefore, it doesn't really matter whether I enter in the input ticker a specific futures contract or a spread or a continuous contract. Uh, I prefer to use the commitments of trade, traders' data to, together with the continuous contract, namely because of the available history. The disadvantage here is that we have only data since 1917, uh, but that's the limitation imposed by the price of the December 2021 contract. I will show you the commitments of traders' data analysis in the usual setup I use. So I will stick with corn. I will enter the first continuous contract and choose the net positions, the same type of data I selected on the first tab. And here we are, unlike uh, the first tab, here we can uh, zoom out and uh, display the data over the last 5, 20 or even the full period. Uh, you can see that we have data since 1986, which was the beginning of uh, the commitments commitments of traders data. It was the first time when the data was published in its uh, current form. Of course, there were some uh, predecessors to commitments of traders uh, data, so it's up to a debate. But uh, let's say that uh, it started in 1986. Nevertheless, uh, there is not just a single type of data. In fact, uh, there were different kinds of reports. First of all, it was data just for outright futures that was, that was published uh, since the beginning. Uh, and in 1995, the data, the aggregated data for uh, futures and options emerged as a new type of uh, options, uh, futures and options combined uh, commitments of traders uh, report. The next change uh, happened uh, in 2006 
well in fact it was in 2009 but uh, the data was uh, the history the available history was uh, since 2006 uh, and that was the disaggregated data which was a new type of data for physical commodities that used uh, aggregation into different uh, groups and uh, it is uh, the preferable source of data for physical commodities and in order to show you the full history we created something we call composite commitments of traders data uh, where we uh, connect uh, various types of data uh, from different cut reports together but uh, in order to correctly use uh, this composite uh, commitments of traders data, you have to switch to the cot index chart, which is uh, the chart uh, I will go through in a couple of minutes. But right now we are at uh, simple net positions. Uh, it's the most basic type of uh, the commitments of traders chart. And I usually use the last five years and occasionally uh, switch to last two years to get a uh, better zoom on the light, latest few data points but the last five years is my default view uh, of the commitments of traders data there are two curves on the charts uh, representing two major uh, the most important groups in the market the green curve stands for the large speculators uh, which is the managed money group in the disaggregated data uh, while the red curve stands for the hedgers, which is the producers, uh, processors, users, and so on uh, group in the disaggregated uh, data. You can clearly see that uh, most of the time the net positions are inverted, uh, highlighting the different goals of these uh, two groups in the market. But first of all, I should explain how the net positions are calculated. It's a very simple expression. It's just the long positions for a given group minus the short positions for a given group. Uh, that means, for example, that uh, large speculators currently hold uh, roughly uh, 223,000 uh, uh, more long positions than short positions. It is not my goal to explain the commitments of traders' data here. It would be beyond the scope of this tutorial. But uh, I would just say that uh, the intentions of uh, the large speculators is simply to make profit in the markets. And uh, these are usually the large banks, investment banks, hedge funds and other financial institutions and uh, usually their strategy can be described as a trend following and that's the reason why they tend to have uh, the maximum uh, amount of uh, long positions net long positions close to the market peak uh, on the other hand, they tend to be uh, net short or have uh, the uh, lowest amount of uh, net positions when the market is heavily oversold. The hedgers, on the other hand, have a different goal in the market. Uh, they do not want to make profits. They are not speculators. They just want to hedge their physical uh, commodity they want to hedge their business against the price risk uh, and I just noticed uh, one problem that I have uh, uh, net positions for corn on the bottom sub chart but the price for silver on the top sub chart so I'm sorry for this and I will switch uh, back to corn so that the chart is correct and I think it would be pretty clear how these two groups behave in the markets. You can see that when the speculators, the large speculators are heavily net long, uh, that's usually around the uh, intermediate market top. When they are head short, net short or their uh, net, posi net positions are generally low, it's close uh, to the local bottom uh, like, we, like we saw here or here or even here and uh, many times before. 
and uh, it's exactly the opposite uh, with the hedgers because you can see that when they are heavily net short the market is close uh, to a top like we saw here or many times before however uh, keep in mind the commitments of traders data is not a precise timing indicator it tends to be uh, slightly unreliable during strong market trends like we saw in the recent history and it's uh, not exactly wrong it doesn't mean these uh, market participants are wrong because for example the hedgers hedge their production when they consider the price to be uh, really high when they consider the price to be good for them of course uh, they tend to be too early when the market is in a strong uptrend and it can continue higher and that just means the market is uh, overbought but as you know overbought markets can remain overbought for a long time so that's something to keep in mind the commitments of traders data just uh, tells us that the market is overbought or oversold it's not a good idea to use it for uh, short-term timing or precise timing of your trades. But I wanted to explain the logic of Hedger's behavior in more detail. Uh, in this case, uh, we can say that uh, the majority of uh, hedgers are farmers or producers in general because their net positions are usually short. That means that uh, they hedge their future production when the price is appealing to them. For example, a farmer uh, grows, who grows corn uh, decides that the price is good, that the price on the futures market is good, and he decides to hedge this uh, his production in the future uh, so that he eliminates uh, the price risk associated with uh, the normal market fluctuations and now he knows that uh, he will cover his uh, inputs like uh, I don't know the seeds uh, the uh, you know machine machinery and uh, labor costs and so on uh, he doesn't have to hedge all his production and most of the farmers do not fully hedge they usually left some of the crop unpriced but uh, this varies with uh, each farmer so it's uh, up to them what strategy they will choose but the hedgers are not just producers uh, these are also the users i mean the users of the physical commodity like grain processors or mills uh, that uh, produce uh, flour and so on and these usually hedge uh, their input costs which in this case is the corn the commodity when the price tends to be low so they buy they go long when the price is low but uh, the effect is the effect uh, on the curve on the hedger's curve is the same because uh, when the price is appealing to them when it is low they tend to buy futures which uh, uh, pushes the uh, curve the red curve higher so in any case uh, the curve tends to be the highest during during uh, intermediate lows when the users are hedging a lot and uh, the farmers are not hedging at all because uh, the price is not good uh, for them Obviously, the hedgers are the ultimate insiders. Uh, they tend to know the market very well, in some cases uh, for generations, uh, like some farming families. Uh, therefore, uh, they are usually correct in their assessment of the price, which means that when they are hedging, the price is usually too high and we are close to an intermediate top. But uh, as I said, there are exceptions, uh, like during... Uh, strong trends when they tend to be too early on the other hand uh, the net positions uh, don't have to oscillate uh, between the same boundaries for example when the price enters an uptrend the range tends to shift uh, lower as uh, 
we uh, would see if we look uh, uh, back into the future. Uh, sorry, back into the past. Uh, so uh, that's the mechanism behind the uh, hedging operations of uh, the hedgers like farmers and the users of physical commodity. But uh, do not uh, disregard uh, the speculators because they are also an important group because they uh, take the price risk from the hedgers. The hedgers want to get rid of the price risk and the speculators uh, take over the risk uh, with uh, the expectation of potential profit. Without the speculators, the market would not work. And that was all about the net positions. Uh, now let's move to the second uh, commitment of traders chart, which is the cut positions index. It is my favorite uh, product uh, out of the cut data, and this is the only one uh, you should use if you analyze long-term history uh, and use our composite commitments of traders data. Uh, so there is no problem, uh, as you can see here, to analyze data since the beginning. But uh, let's uh, zoom in and explain the difference between the uh, cut position index and the net positions. The cut position index is just uh, normalization of uh, the net positions. It is calculated as taking... Uh, long positions in a given group minus short positions in a given group and dividing this expression by uh, long positions plus short positions in a given group. That means uh, the cut index uh, takes the changing open interest within a given group into account. And that is necessary over long periods of time because uh, the markets are changing. The size of the market is changing. Usually the markets were much smaller years ago. So the net positions, the simple difference uh, can distort the reality while the cut position index uh, uh, is the correct metric for analysis across uh, long-term history of data. To be honest, uh, there are multiple ways to calculate uh, the cut index. Uh, some other platforms are using the min-max normalization on some interval of data. I would say that's the most uh, common form of cut index. On the other hand, I prefer to use uh, my way because uh, it has some advantages. Uh, the uh, greatest advantage is that uh, you do not depend on setting the correct, correct period. There is no parameter that you have to enter. And uh, you can also replicate the min-max normalization just by uh, zooming the chart because when you uh, zoom in or zoom out, uh, the chart scales, uh, the y-axis scales to uh, show uh, the chart across, uh, oh, I mean from the minimum to maximum across the whole available space. So this way you can easily replicate the min-max normalization and compare the maximums and minimums or I mean compare the current value to the maximums and uh, minimums. But on the longer term, longer time frames, uh, our way is definitely superior because it avoids using uh, additional parameters. But uh, to be fair, there is not much difference on uh, shorter periods. Uh, it doesn't even matter if you use the net positions or the cut position index on uh, periods uh, of a few years, like below five years, because there is not much difference. The markets are not usually changing that fast. Uh, but, uh, you know, over uh, intervals greater than five years, I would definitely stick to the cut index. 
Naturally, our cut index can oscillate only between uh, minus 0.1 and uh, 1.1, so between minus 1 and uh, plus 1. And uh, theoretically, if the cut index gets to plus 1, that would mean that uh, the, uh, all the positions uh, within a given group are long positions. On the other hand, if it gets to minus one, that would mean that all the positions within the group are short positions. Uh, these are the situations that can happen in some really uh, small, less liquid markets. In uh, you know large markets like corn, it can usually just come come near to the minus one like we uh, or plus one like we see here when the cut index was roughly uh, 0 0.87 uh, but that means that uh, nearly all the positions uh, in that group are long positions otherwise the cut index is used in the same way as the net positions uh, you look for elevated levels by comparing them with uh, the previous peaks and uh, when uh, we have such a peak on uh, uh, large speculators on managed money and uh, uh, bottom in hedgers that would mean the price is close to a local high of course you have to remember then that when the market regime changes and the market moves from sideways action or a bear market into bull market the be behavior of the cut index uh, will also change so that's something to keep in mind but otherwise if you interpret the cut data correctly it will work very well and now i will quickly move uh, through uh, the rest of the commitments uh, of traders data products and i will start with uh, the net traders the chart looks uh, similar to the net positions but uh, the difference is on the y-axis uh, on the net positions there were hundreds of thousands of positions but here it is just uh, tens of traders there are more types of data in the co2 report and one of them is the number of traders who are predominantly long or short on a given market and here the net traders product is simply the difference uh, between traders who are long and the traders who are short within a given group of uh, market participants of course it works similar to the net positions uh, albeit uh, here it is uh, more like the true democracy because each trader has a single vote no matter the size of his or her account i would say it is once again similar to the breadth in the stock market and i tend to use uh, this chart as sort of a confirmation for the cut position index or the net positions in this case but uh, the net positions or the cut position index basically the positioning data is much more important so this is only useful if you are in doubts or want to you know delve into the data and uh, be absolutely sure that uh, uh, the outcome of your analysis is correct we also have uh, the net traders index once again uh, the calculation is similar to the cut position index uh, the only difference is that you use the number of traders uh, rather than the uh, positions so in this case uh, you just take the traders who are long minus traders who are short or i mean predominantly short and divide this by uh, the total number of traders in a given group i mean uh, the traders who are long plus traders who are short so the same expression as in the cut position index and the use case is the same uh, maybe i forgot one thing i used uh, cut traders index uh, maybe more than 10 years ago from 2008 till 2011 as a tool that uh, 
tend to move early than the cut position index itself on metals because I was trading option strategies on uh, uh, GLD ETF and the silver ETF and uh, this proved to be quite uh, useful. Of course, the cut position index was uh, still more relevant to me even back then. But I noticed that this uh, trader's index uh, sometimes tend to be early even compared to the cut position index. So uh, maybe that uh, is worth mentioning, but I uh, don't know how it works today. I do not use it anymore. So maybe it's up to you to explore uh, this strategy. And finally, we have uh, concentration ratios uh, on spread charts, which is once again, another type of data in the COT report. And the explanation is uh, quite simple. Uh, as the description in the legend suggests, uh, it shows the percentage of open interest held by the four largest traders. In other words, uh, it shows uh, how much of the open interest is controlled by the traders holding the four largest uh, net long positions in this case. That is uh, the green curve, of course. The red curve uh, shows the same, but for the traders, four, lar four traders holding the uh, largest uh, net short position. Uh, I would say this is a special version of the COT uh, report itself because the commitments of traders data is useful because you can look into the cards of uh, the large players in the markets. And this is even more extreme version because you are looking into positioning of the four largest traders in the market. Despite this fact, uh, it is not as helpful as uh, the positioning data. I would say it's much less useful. And that's before the crucial part of the COT analysis is the aggregation into different groups of market participants. But here we do not have this uh, distinction. We do not know if these uh, traders, these long net long traders or net short traders are hedgers or speculators, or how many of them uh, are hedgers and how many of them are speculators. And keep in mind that uh, the long traders or net long traders are different to the net short traders, obviously. Without this knowledge, uh, it's much, much less useful because the behavior of each group is totally different. And the interpretation of the data is therefore very difficult to do. Of course, uh, if we uh, analyze the curves carefully, we might guess uh, which group uh, is dominated by speculators and which one is dominated by hedgers. And keep in mind, it differs across uh, commodities. It's not the same. Uh, that's also another reason why this is a complicated product. Nevertheless, it might be used uh, once again as a tool for more detailed analysis and especially the final chart, which is just uh, the product of uh, the concentration ratios. It is called the net concentration index and it's just the difference between those two curves on the previous chart, between the four largest traders who are net, net long and four largest traders, uh, I mean, four traders holding the largest net short positions. In other words, if you subtract the red curve from the green curve on the previous chart on the concentration ratios, you will get uh, this product. And here you can already witness some uh, correlation with the price. So it is sometimes useful, maybe as a proxy into the behavior of the absolutely largest players in the market, but still I would be rather careful with the interpretation and personally I do not use this chart uh, very often. 
And that's finally all about this group of charts, uh, about the commitments of traders' data. Uh, just to remind you, you can uh, show the COT data even for ratios or inter-market spreads. Basically, uh, the spreads or ratios uh, made of uh, contracts from different commodities but in this case uh, there will be options for uh, all the commodities in the input expression but uh, otherwise the charts are the same and now I will finally uh, get to the last two charts that I will explain to you today and uh, these are the continuous price and the continuous histogram and I will start with the histogram. It's uh, an advanced statistical chart that is used for valuation analysis. It is best applied to mean reverting time series. And there is no better example of a mean reverting uh, data than this ratio between the first continuous contract on corn and the first uh, continuous contract on soybeans. You can see how the price uh, nicely oscillate uh, around some value. This uh, mean reverting nature is often a sign of a fundamental relationship between those two components in the ratio. And that's true in this case, because uh, both corn and soybeans are grains. They can uh, substitute each other, uh, either as feed or even in the biofuel industry. Uh, there can be, they can be produced on the same uh, acreage. Uh, they often compete for uh, the same acreage uh, based on their price and other conditions. So it makes sense in this case that uh, they will have a relationship and we will see this relationship on this ratio between the price of corn and soybeans. Of course, uh, not just the ratios are mean reverting. For example, all the spreads are mean reverting uh, over the long term or uh, the continuous contango that's a great example because i use it in practice that's a mean reverting, mean reverting uh, quantity uh, even the prices of some commodities can be mean reverting especially in the short term but uh, over the long term there can be trends and this condition might not be satisfied but it's still better than the stock market because uh, unlike commodities, the stock market is known for long-term uptrend, uh, most notably the US stock market. So uh, it would be outright uh, wrong to apply this valuation analysis to the stock market. But the spreads, ratios, even the price of some commodities in the short term these are all the good examples for uh, the valuation analysis. But let's get to the point. Uh, here is the continuous histogram for this ratio. Uh, this is how it looks like. And I will show you the typical setup I use for this analysis. And I just uh, add a new subchart. And uh, it's basically the same chart <laughs> that I had before. It's the price of uh, the ratio itself. And the reason why I use this setup is that uh, the price on the bottom subchart serves as the input data to the histogram on the top subchart. And that's uh, quite useful because, for example, when I identify some extreme or some uh, uh, congestion on the histogram, I can take a closer look at uh, the chart below and find the period when the extreme happened and analyze it in detail, for example, uh, I can find out uh, what was the period when the price was uh, at extreme or, well, get more information from the detailed price below. 
the great thing about this setup is that these two charts are synchronized not in the same way as uh, two time series because uh, the bottom axis are incompatible in this case but uh, by the way that's the reason why the uh, mouse zoom is disabled on the bottom subchart but if you switch to another uh, zoom in, uh, on the, in the right panel, uh, basically the displayed period on the bottom subchart will change, in this case to the last 20 years, and even the histogram will change uh, to the 20 year histogram, which means that the input data and the histogram are synchronized. And that's great because uh, this way you can simply switch uh, between the periods and uh, both the bottom and the top subcharts will stay synchronized. But what do you actually see on the chart, on the histogram chart? Well, the bottom axis is price. In fact, it's the vertical axis from the bottom subchart. It's created by dividing this vertical axis uh, into a number of bins or buckets. And then all the observation over the specified period are divided or summed into these uh, buckets. So the uh, right axis on the histogram chart is the number of counts over the specified period. For example, uh, this column uh, corresponds to the interval around the value, around the price of 0 0.36. And uh, you can see that there are 342 counts in this bucket. What does it mean? Well, if you go to the bottom subchart and uh, find roughly the price of uh, 0 0.36, uh, and um, create a small interval around that price and uh, count all the instances when the price uh, closed at this or in this interval uh, and then summarize all these, count all these instances you will get exactly 342 uh, cases when the price was around that interval. Of course, the histogram is using the end of day prices as uh, uh, all the data on spread charts are end of day data. And this blue vertical line uh, corresponds to the last value. Uh, of course, the line is aligned to the center to the center of uh, the nearest bucket, which means that uh, uh, there is a little imprecision, but that's not important in this case because uh, the precision is uh, enough for this uh, chart, for this study. But you can see that uh, the last value uh, is currently around 0 0.38 or 39. And if you uh, get at the end of the chart, of the price chart, you can truly see that the price closed at 0 0.39, uh, which is in line with, uh, the, with the last value because it falls into the interval specified by uh, this bucket. But uh, what is the meaning of this chart? Well, it basically shows the distribution of the data, the distribution of uh, the price in this case, over some uh, specific period uh, of time. And it's the shape of the distribution that's uh, important and that uh, we try to analyze. For example, let's notice uh, this cluster of tall columns. You can see that uh, they are, or the range is roughly uh, from 0 0.35 till 0 0.4 and this cluster acts as a magnet for the price. Uh, if you go to the chart below uh, it corresponds to the uh, to this area 
to the range between 0 0.35 0 0.4 and you can truly see that the price uh, uh, over this period of time uh, tended to return into this area uh, for example here or here and here here uh, and here or here and finally here in uh, 2020 so uh, if it uh, uh, deviated too much from uh, this uh, range uh, it eventually returned into it uh, somewhat later and this is uh, in contrast with uh, uh, this uh, area of the histogram because the columns here are much shorter than uh, this than in this cluster and truly when we uh, take a look at the prices below 0 0.35 uh, we can see that the price usually dropped into this area but quickly recovered uh, above so it did not spend uh, so much time uh, in uh, the area below 0 0.35 so that's exactly what we see on the histogram and it's very clearly visible on this study it's just a matter of seconds uh, before you get uh, the distribution of course uh, you might say that uh, we can retrieve the same information from the price chart itself and uh, you would be correct but uh, i picked this specific chart as a great example because it looks nice uh, not all the charts are uh, so well behaved the price is usually noisy or it is uh, trending a bit over that period of time and uh, the histogram offers much more clarity for this type of analysis so that was the first use case uh, when we analyze the shape of the distribution itself. And by the way, uh, even the first look on the distribution can tell you a lot because when you see that it is nicely symmetrical as in this case, there are no big tails, it is not skewed, that means uh, the quantity uh, below, I mean the, the input data, is mean reverting and there probably is some fundamental relationship between uh, these two contracts uh, in the ratio. Uh, but let's move to the second use case uh, that has a lot to do with uh, uh, the tails and uh, these colored uh, areas. I will switch back to the 20-year uh, period so the, to the chart is the same as uh, before. And the tails themselves also act as uh, supports or resistances because when the price gets uh, close to the tail it's uh, very likely that it will turn higher again especially if we are analyzing a mean reverting quantity as uh, the ratio uh, below uh, so that's one use case for the tails another one is uh, highlighted by these uh, colored ranges these are basically percentile ranges you can display just one of them by uh, hiding another in the legend so let's start with the first one with the red one that uh, specifies uh, the area between the 25th and the 75th percentile so the left boundary uh, is the 25th percentile and by the way it's once again aligned to the center of the nearest bucket uh, so there is a slight imprecision but that's not important in this case the precision is uh, totally sufficient for this study but uh, the meaning of this boundary is that uh, below this uh, red uh, color on the left tail are the 25 uh, uh, percent of the lowest values in other words uh, if you take all the prices over the past 20 years and order them from the lowest to the highest price then the 25 percent exactly the quarter of the lowest prices will fall into this 
white area left of the uh, red color trench. So that's pretty simple. I think it's quite understandable. Uh, the right boundary uh, specifies the 75th percentile. So to the right of this boundary are the uh, values that uh, uh, make 25 highest values on the bottom subchart on the price chart. And because the, le the red color trench starts uh, at 25th percentile and ends uh, by the 75th percentile, we can say that exactly half of the values, 50%, uh, fall into this uh, interval. And that's also the reason why I tend to use uh, this range as an uh, approximate uh, uh, interval where the price tends to return over time, especially if it uh, gets into an extreme, then over long period of time, it uh, tends to return back into the uh, red colored interval. Of course, uh, this is true only for mean reverting time series. Uh, the trending uh, prices uh, will run or can run higher or lower uh, forever. Uh, but let's move to the green uh, colored range and uh, it is used in a slightly different way. I use it to identify the extremes. It runs from the fifth till the 95th percentile, which means that uh, to the left side of the green area there are just 5% of the lowest values. Which means that when the price uh, drops so low that uh, it gets uh, out of the green field, uh, that uh, we can consider uh, such an incursion to be pretty rare. The left boundary in this case uh, is uh, around 0 0.32, uh, which is roughly here. And... Uh, there are not many values uh, below this price. So if the price gets so low, it's a pretty rare occasion and uh, it will probably mean revert uh, in the long term. And the same is true just in the opposite sense uh, for the right boundary, which is at around 0 0.52 uh, around here. And once again, not many, not many values uh, are above uh, this price. So if the price uh, moves above this uh, value, above this price, it's likely that uh, it will eventually get back in the long term. These uh, 5th and 95th percentiles are just some arbitrary values. Uh, so, uh, of course, the price can turn higher below them or even above them in this case. Uh, the point is that I picked this interval that uh, the green area holds roughly 90% of all the values. Uh, but you can also uh, watch just the shape of the distribution itself. And if the price gets close to the left or the right tail, it's probably uh, time to watch for a mean reversal. How is this uh, useful in practice? Well, let's say that uh, the price, I mean the ratio, gets above uh, this uh, red, uh, sorry, the green colored uh, range somewhere around here. That would mean the corn is very expensive compared to soybeans. And that in turn will lead farmers to grow more corn next year. Uh, on the other hand, hog breeders will increase their demand for soybeans. They will switch to soybeans because it will be relatively cheaper compared to corn. And this imbalance will be naturally resolved over time because there will be more corn next year and the increased demand for uh, soybeans uh, by uh, the hog breeders will lead to the increase in price uh, of soybean meal and other uh, products of uh, soybeans. And this is an opportunity because uh, intermarket uh, spread traders can speculate on this mean 
cleaner version. So that's uh, a practical example how to use this chart, how to use this analysis to your advantage. Before I move to the next example, uh, I would like to recommend you to use uh, five uh, years or more for this type of valuation analysis because there is simply not enough data in the two-year period or the single-year period, so the statistics would not be as uh, reliable in this case. And don't forget that uh, you can pick the role methodology even for the histogram chart. Uh, that's because uh, uh, the role methodology of the price chart has to be the same as uh, for the histogram in order to use this uh, type, these two types of charts together. Uh, there is nothing forcing you to do so. Uh, for example, you can switch to the role methodology by maximum open interest. But in that case, uh, the top subchart would display different data than the bottom subchart. So uh, that's the reason why I recommend you to use uh, the same role methodology for uh, all these charts in case you will use it uh, in the same setup as I'm using it. And now I would like to show you a few more examples because the histogram chart is very useful and versatile. I mentioned the Contango analysis, so let's take a look at the continuous Contango and I will pick some different commodities so we are not analyzing uh, grains all the time. So let's take a look, for example, on coffee. So I will show you the Contango between the first two expiration contracts on coffee. So I will start by uh, multiplying the expression by 100 because we want the percentage Contango. Then I will enter the second continuous contract minus the first continuous contract and divide this by the first continuous contract so that we get the uh, Contango. And I will use the same uh, combination, the same chart setup, so I will uh, pick the uh, continuous histogram on the top and show you the price chart on the bottom. So we have basically the same template as uh, before, and here we are. The first observation is that uh, the distribution is uh, rather symmetrical. Of course, it's slightly skewed, but and the uh, right tail is uh, quite long. But nevertheless, uh, we can find uh, well-defined symmetry on the chart, and it's also visible on the price itself that uh, it has moved in a well-defined range over the past 20 years. And uh, that fits uh, the thing I already told you that uh, even the continuous contango is a mean reverting quantity in the same way as uh, the spreads, for example. But uh, what is it good for? Well, the spikes, the contango spikes, such as this one, are usually associated with uh, price bottoms on the commodity itself. And vice versa, the uh, backwardation spikes into the negative area are usually the signs of uh, approaching price top. So it makes sense to look for extremes uh, in the Contango distribution and the continuous histogram it was just born for this role. So uh, I think it's pretty obvious how to use it to spot these extremes. And once again, you might say that uh, we can clearly see them on the price itself, but I would say it's much more comfortable for uh, searching them on the histogram. And that's not all. Uh, you might have noticed uh, this statistic in the top left corner that uh, wasn't uh, originally present uh, on the previous chart. And the reason is simple. Whenever there are some negative values in the data, the statistic will appear exactly here. And uh, all the values uh, in this ratio 
uh, were actually positive so there was no reason to display it uh, over here but here uh, there are negative values there is backwardation it's normal that uh, uh, the contango oscillate uh, uh, from the positive to the negative values and it is very useful especially for spread traders if you trade inter-delivery spreads uh, or calendar spreads, in other words, uh, you know that uh, the commodities that exhibit uh, a large percentage of contango are great for bear spreads. On the other hand, commodities uh, where the contango is not as prevalent and the backwardation uh, happens quite often. These commodities are great for bull spread strategies. And uh, in this particular example, we can see that coffee spent 99% of the time in positive contango, uh, which is extraordinary. That means this uh, market was great for bear spreads. They worked like magic uh, over the past decade, uh, as I remember. So this is a very valuable information. Of course, uh, there is no guarantee that uh, the next 20 years will look the same as uh, the previous 20 years, but still the information is very useful. But keep in mind, this uh, particular value is really extreme. The typical values uh, even uh, in the markets that are well known for prevalent contango like some grains, uh, the typical values are um, around 70, 80 percent. So 99, that's really quite rare. So this is another reason why the histogram is such a powerful tool. And once again, you can get the same information from the price chart itself. But uh, this is not a typical example, because here we can clearly see that the Contenco was positive uh, nearly all the time over the past uh, 20 years. But if I zoom out and show you all the available data, data uh, for coffee, uh, you can see that uh, the negative Contengo, the backwardation, was much more common uh, over the uh, 20th uh, century in coffee. And it's uh, no longer as simple to estimate the ratio between the positive and uh, negative Contengo. So here the histogram and this particular statistic comes very useful. Before I move to explain the final type of chart, uh, I would like to show you one more example for histogram because it will be different than uh, the previous two. Uh, we will uh, work with uh, non-mean reverting uh, quantity because we will take a look at the price itself that is uh, trending higher. So I will pick, for example, the first continuous contract uh, on gold. Uh, of course, I will select the continuous new histogram but this time I will select switch to the role methodology using the maximum open interest uh, because otherwise uh, the uh, even the non-liquid contracts would be included in the price and that's something we do not want so by selecting the maximum open interest we ensure that uh, only the liquid contracts uh, will be plugged into the uh, first continuous contract and below I will pick exactly the same uh, just select the price uh, switch to the maximum open interest or methodology and uh, uh, here we are uh, here is the uh, chart here is the example and the first observation that is uh, very clear is that uh, this time series is not mean reverting it is trending higher over time. If we zoom out even further to the 47 years of data, it is even more visible. It is very clear this is not something that mean reverts. It's very unlikely gold will mean revert back somewhere below uh, $1,000. And this is also uh, clearly visible and confirmed by the histogram itself. Uh, 
it looks uh, rather weird there is no symmetrical distribution so that's uh, the proof that uh, gold price is a trending asset it's not a mean reverting uh, time series so what's the point of uh, using the histogram if uh, the data is not mean reverting well, in this case, uh, we will avoid uh, long-term periods and instead focus on the short-term data, short-term periods. So I will switch to the last two years and we will use the histogram to estimate uh, the potential supports and resistances or the congestion uh, areas uh, on the price itself. And we will once again focus on the shape of the distribution. We can hide the percentile ranges because they will not be important this time. And let's focus on these uh, columns. You can notice uh, two clusters of columns. The first one is uh, this white cluster ranging roughly from uh, 1600 uh, 70, 80, who knows, uh, till 1970. And the second cluster is this one uh, between 1470 till 1590. And the point is that uh, once the price uh, is within such a cluster, it tends to stay in the cluster for some time. So, for example, if the price <coughs> will move lower and approach the left tail of this cluster, there is a very decent chance uh, it will uh, turn up and mean revert back into the cluster. That doesn't mean the price will turn around every time it uh, gets uh, to the left or the right tail. It's the same as with uh, any other support or resistance. It can be broken. And I would say most of the supports or resistances are eventually broken. The point is that there is an increased chance of a price reaction in that uh, particular area. And even if uh, the tail is broken to the downside, then the price will most likely spend some time in the left cluster in the same way it did uh, in the right cluster. And uh, if you look to the price below, it just worked that way so far. The price uh, is moving sideways for many months and whenever it got uh, uh, below 1700 or close to 1700 it turned up and even uh, and uh, also when it uh, got close to uh, the to the price around 1960 70 it turned down so uh, this is the proof that uh, there was some kind of cluster and the price uh, spent a lot of time in this range. But of course, and that's also my expectation, that uh, it will eventually be broken higher or um, into some direction. So this is a great example how you can use the continuous histogram on the price itself and even on underlyings uh, that are obviously trending over the long term. That's because when you zoom in, that even such commodities, such markets, uh, tend to move uh, sideways in the short term or consolidate. And this can provide uh, areas where the price tend to stay for quite some time or visit them again in the future. And uh, this can provide you an edge in your trading. And the histogram is the best possible way how to identify these areas. And finally, I'm going to explain you the last type of chart, which is the continuous price. And this chart is critical when you want to analyze a specific opportunity, not the market as a whole, but a specific opportunity, a specific contract or specific spread and so on. Uh, I will close these two uh, tabs because uh, we will not need them anymore. And uh, 
I will move to the first tab and I will show you the continuous price for the December uh, 2021 contract on corn. So it's this uh, second option under the price group. So I will pick the continuous price and click to chart uh, the continuous price of uh, this corn contract. And here it is. I will zoom to the last two years so that uh, you will see what the price on this chart uh, really represents. It may be a bit uh, confusing because uh, continuous price, that sounds like continuous contract. Uh, these two have one thing in common. They are both artificial time series. You cannot trade continuous contract or the continuous price on the exchange. But there is one crucial difference. The continuous contract is made of all the expiration months. For example, if uh, the corn has uh, uh, March, May, July, September, uh, December expirations, then all of these expiration months will appear uh, in, the, in the price of the continuous contract. Not in the continuous price of a specific contract, because it's also made out of uh, different contracts. As you can see, the blue curve represents the current contract you entered into the input field. And the red curve uh, is a different contract, uh, which is also true for the orange curve and, and so on. But the red curve is not the previous expiration in a sense that uh, the expiration be uh, before December 2021 is uh, September. No, the red curve represents, once again, December expiration, but this time from 2020 and the orange contract the orange curve represents December expiration 2019 so all the contracts in the continuous price are for the same expiration month but just a different expiration year if I zoom out, uh, the chart will get aggregated into candlesticks. Uh, but even if uh, I zoom in in some different part of the uh, chart, for example here, and select uh, a period of two years or less, it will once again switch into the line chart, into the daily chart. And once again, these are all December expirations. December 2016, December 2015, December 2014. So it will always be the same expiration month, which is December, because you entered the December 2021 expiration. Uh, how does it work with uh, the interdelivery spreads? Well, it's just the same. Uh, let's switch back to the original spread we uh, had here, which was uh, uh, December, well, no, July 2022, uh, December 2021, if I remember it correctly. And I will show you the continuous price. And I will uh, display the same period. In other words, I will use the same zoom two years and the blue curve once again is the contract we selected the July 2022 December 2021 and the previous one is the same I mean the expiration months are the same July and December previous year so it is the same contract just with uh, an expiration a year earlier that's July 2021 minus December 2020. And if we move uh, to the orange curve, it's July 2020, December 2019, which is uh, uh, two year offset compared to our uh, original expression, the original input. So the mechanism is the same as with outright futures. Uh, 
all the contracts are shifted uh, by a year, two years and so on, but the expiration months stay the same. What is it good for? Well, as I told you, when you analyze some commodity as a whole, it's totally fine to use the continuous contract. However, when you are analyzing a specific opportunity, you have to use the continuous price of a specific contract or spread. And I will show you why. Let's do an example with uh, natural gas. Uh, I pick natural gas because uh, there are uh, large differences between individual expiration months due to the compar comparatively high heating demand in the winter compared to the uh, off season. So let's pick the front contract, which is September currently on natural gas, and I will uh, select the continuous price. But I will also add the first uh, continuous contract uh, below. Oh, sorry, the first contract. And I will pick uh, the price chart, of course. Right now, these two uh, time series are the same because when I zoom in and show you the last price, they will be the same. It's uh, $3.914 dollars uh, in both cases. But when I zoom out, you will see huge differences uh, between those two uh, time series. For example, take this spike in November 2018. There is no such spike on the continuous price of the September contract. Why is that? Well, I suspect there was some early intrusion of uh, Arctic air into the continental US. And that caused this uh, spike uh, on the uh, first continuous contract. These bars probably correspond to the December expiration. And December expiration is the first uh, contract from the heating season. And it is very susceptible to the weather because the freezing temperatures uh, raises the fears of uh, the uh, sufficiency of the in net gas inventories for the entire winter. However, the same bars on the continuous price of the September expiration above corresponded to the uh, September 2020 expiration, which is, or which was back then, quite a distant expiration from next year, from off season. And that's the reason why there was no spike, because it was uh, in the off season and it was also so far away that uh, the market thought there is uh, still a lot of time for building enough inventories uh, till then. And that's well, that's the explanation. And if you, for example, uh, are thinking about uh, trading a strategy <clears throat> or opening a position on some September expiration, uh, then you have to use this top chart. Because if you are using the bottom sub chart, uh, you're using the wrong data. Uh, because uh, something like that uh, is unlikely to happen on the September expiration, at least uh, not uh, in November. So by relying on continuous uh, contracts when you are interested in trading specific expirations uh, like the September expiration, you're introducing wrong data into your analysis and that would lead to uh, incorrect trading uh, decisions, which, of course, would cost you money. But that's not all. This uh, discrepancy is even more obvious and more important when you are a spread trader. Let's make uh, a bull spread uh, out of this uh, first chart. So uh, let's make the tightest possible uh, combination, which is uh, September minus October. Uh, 2021. So let's do this. And uh, this spread would uh, right now correspond to the uh, spread between the first two continuous contracts on uh, natural gas. So let's do this. And uh, 
let's uh, zoom in and you can see that the last price is the same uh, roughly the same no roughly it's it's exactly the same uh, but uh, let's take a look uh, at longer term history I will zoom out and you can clearly see the huge uh, differences between those two uh, time series uh, let's notice this spike here that is not present on the chart above or this spike also it's not there and when I zoom out even further these two charts are like two different spreads two different commodities it doesn't make sense to use the spreads of continuous contracts when you are interested in analyzing and trading a specific spread even if I zoom in to the last two years, you can see the differences uh, that are so obvious that uh, it's just striking. So the conclusion is that when you are interested in trading a specific spread, a specific contract, you have to use the continuous price. Only when you're analyzing the commodity as a whole, then continuous contracts are sufficient. And that's the reason when you are doing a valuation analysis of uh, some spread, for example, like this one, uh, and you are using the continuous histogram, then the input data into that histogram is the continuous price. So I will show you uh, my usual setup and you can see that uh, the input data into the histogram above is uh, the bottom subchart. Even when you zoom out, uh, basically uh, this distribution is made out of uh, this data below. And by the way, this is a very powerful analytical tool for doing valuation of uh, spreads or individual uh, contracts. Uh, you can see immediately that, for example, this spread is overvalued uh, based on the five-year uh, data distribution. Even if you zoom out, uh, uh, the distribution is getting skewed uh, due to the uh, contango spikes on NetGas, but still it's very easy to use, uh, simple and yet very powerful. While I'm showing you these uh, practical examples, I totally forgot to explain the way the individual contracts uh, are selected or assembled to create this uh, continuous price. So uh, I will use uh, another example. Let's go back to uh, corn and uh, I will pick some more distant contract because it will be more obvious when I use uh, distant expiration such as this one. It's uh, 2022 December expiration uh, which currently is roughly a year and a half from now because I'm doing this video at the end of uh, July. So here's the continuous price and uh, the question is how these uh, individual years are selected to make this continuous price. The obvious way would be to select uh, the last year of life for each contract and connect them together into the continuous price. And to be honest, uh, we originally used this selection method, but uh, later I decided to switch uh, to a different algorithm. And the reason is that uh, it works fine for contracts that have less than a year till expiration. But when you have a contract that is more than a year away, I mean the expiration is more than a year away, such as this one, you would be left with no data for the current contract. In other words, uh, there would be no blue curve, no data for the 2022 expiration, because when you try to select the last year of data to expiration for a contract that has uh, one and a half year to expiration right now, you would be left with uh, an empty set. 
it wouldn't be uh, such a problem for outright futures because you rarely trade so distant expirations. But it is quite common in spreads to trade uh, even the spreads that have uh, more than a year till expiration. So you would be left with uh, no data for the entered spread and the valuation analysis would be impossible to do. Therefore, I devised a different selection method. When you are doing any statistical analysis, uh, you want to have uh, relevant data and you want to have as much data as possible. But these two uh, requirements uh, go against each other. That's because uh, when you start increasing your data set above a certain point, you are forced to include even the data that is less relevant to your observation, to your analysis. So I came up with a selection method that I think uh, strikes a perfect balance between those two. The algorithm finds a date in each contract that is equivalent with the current date, which means a date that has the same time till expiration and then selects six months of data around the date symmetrically. Uh, therefore, you can see that right now um, it's uh, July 30, the end of July. When we find uh, roughly the end of July for the previous expiration and take six months of the data from the future and six months of the data from the past, we get the data set for a single expiration year. And then we just do the same for the previous expiration and so on and on. Of course, uh, the current year is an exception because we uh, do not have uh, the data from the future. Uh, we are just left with the data from the past. So uh, we just select the last six, mo six months for the current year. This uh, selection method has a few advantages. The first one is that we always have the data for the current contract, for the contract you entered into the input field. The second advantage is that uh, uh, the selected data, the statistical data set, is uh, as much relevant as possible to the current observation, to the last price. That's because the time till expiration is a critical parameter. Uh, a contract or spread that has, that has uh, a month or two till expiration is behaving uh, totally different to the same spread that has uh, two years till expiration. So this method tries to select as much data as possible so that the price is truly continuous. We have a continuous curve. And this data is, uh, the cl has the closest time till expiration compared to the last value. So this is a huge advantage of this selection method. You're probably wondering what happens if we have a contract that has less than six months till expiration. Uh, in that case, uh, the algorithm switch back to the original method, which means that it selects the last year of data for each contract. Otherwise, it would not be possible to have a continuous uh, price chart. Regarding the inter-delivery spreads or spreads in general, the mechanism is the same. Uh, the proof is here because uh, you can see the continuous price for this spread and, uh, well, it works the same as uh, with outright uh, futures. Okay, so is that finally all about the continuous price? Uh, well, not exactly. <laughs> there is one more thing. Uh, you might have noticed the tools button and uh, there is uh, an option to shift the contract window uh, into the future or into the past. And uh, I will explain this feature that is intended for rather power users of uh, our app than the beginners. I told you that uh, the selection algorithm picks uh, six months around the current date. 
but you can shift this contract window to the right or to the, to the left, in other words, to the future or to the past, by a specific number of days using this parameter. I will demonstrate this uh, on a simple example. Uh, I will create a second chart uh, that will be exactly uh, the same. So here we go. Uh, we have a continuous price for December expiration 2022 on corn. Uh, so the top and the bottom subcharts are the same as you can see yourself. And now let's shift the top subchart 60 days into the future. Uh, I think it will be pretty obvious uh, what happens. Uh, once the chart loads up, uh, you can see that the rollover point shifted into the future exactly by 60 days. So that's uh, the way you can affect the contract window, the selection algorithm. And it's the true for all the rollover points in the past, as you can see here, compared to the original rollover uh, point. You are also reminded uh, about this uh, transformation by this message uh, in the top left corner. And you can also shift uh, in a similar way to the past using the uh, minus uh, sign before the number. And uh, this will shift the uh, rollover point 60 days into the past, as you can see here. So. I think it is uh, quite simple. You are free to select any whole number in a specific range. Uh, in other words, uh, you cannot uh, pick, for example, 1000 uh, because uh, the range is uh, bounded uh, by minus 178 and 178. Uh, why exactly these numbers? Well, it would be obvious when I pick the uh, highest possible offset, which is uh, uh, 178. And uh, you will see that uh, we have shifted the contract window so much into the future that there is uh, very few data points uh, left from the original contract. So that's why we decided to implement this boundary. It is there to ensure that uh, there will always be some data left for the uh, expiration year you entered into the input field, into the year you are analyzing. So that's the reason for the limitation in the offset. And if you mm, enter zero or just nothing and uh, uh, make the chart again, uh, you will revert back into the default uh, uh, selection method of uh, six months around the current date. So I think it's uh, quite understandable. I guess right now you're probably asking <laughs> the familiar question. What is it good for? Well, I can think about uh, two use cases when this comes really handy. The first one is that when you have to, uh, or not have to, when you just wish to uh, influence your statistical data set for the valuation analysis, most often you would like to shift the contract window slightly to the future because you are more interested about the uh, future uh, observations. You are not so much interested about the past uh, data points, uh, especially if you are, for example, uh, charting or analyzing a more distant spread where the later observations are uh, quite uh, less liquid, uh, or you just want to put more weight on the future data points. The second use case is much more interesting. Let's say you want to do a valuation analysis of uh, some spreads. Let's select the spread in coffee. Uh, these spreads in coffee uh, uh, 
for example, this one. These spreads, uh, bear spreads in coffee, have been very lazy and uh, well-behaved spreads due to the strong contango in coffee. So uh, let's enter the continuous price. This is our typical combination of charts, at least what we are using for the valuation analysis. And uh, here we go. Uh, this is the uh, valuation analysis over the past two decades when the coffee was uh, in back, um, sorry, in Contango nearly all the time. These spreads are well known for their um, pretty good risk profile. They are lazy. Yet, when you zoom in, you would be surprised by these sharp uh, drops in the spread and uh, the volatility, such as this one, that's, that looks weird. It will become obvious uh, when I show you uh, the stacked seasonality chart for this particular spread. Uh, you can see that the spread is indeed quite lazy with the exception of uh, a month or a month and a half before the expiration when it just turns crazy. This is not uncommon. Uh, something like this uh, happens on many inter-delivery spreads, but it is more uh, visible here due to the uh, calm nature of this particular spread. The problem is that uh, these uh, data points are just bloating your valuation analysis. No sane trader would uh, be in this trade, in this spread, uh, once it gets so close to the expiration. Everybody uh, will get out before this uh, craziness starts to happen. And yet you are, have to uh, deal with uh, this uh, volatility uh, in your analysis. But that's exactly the situation uh, where you can get rid of uh, this bloated data from your statistical data set by shifting, shifting uh, the contract window uh, into the past. So let's say that uh, we will shift the contract window by some 50 days, that would be enough to get rid of the uh, of the volatility near the expiration. So I will enter minus 50 days and uh, click chart. And you will see how the continuous price will suddenly look much better. And here it is. And of course, I have to do the same with the continuous histogram because uh, the data below the continuous price serves as input into the continuous uh, histogram above. So here we go. Even the distribution will be uh, much nicer. So this is the way to get rid of the data near the expiration you do not want in your data set. You can see that the previous year ends exactly uh, near the end of July, which is somewhere which is somewhere around here. So the minus 50 was uh, minus 50 days was the right parameter for getting rid of the volatility uh, at the end of this uh, spread. So I would say this is a really cool feature. Uh, just to remind you, the continuous histogram is uh, an advanced statistical analysis that's uh, available only for our premium users. Uh, but you can try it on corn, uh, either inter-delivery spreads or outright futures, basically any combination of corn contracts, including the continuous contracts. So this way you can uh, explore this powerful feature and decide uh, whether uh, it is uh, really helpful to your trading or your analytical process. And that's uh, finally all about uh, individual charts. Uh, we have concluded this chapter with uh, this powerful tool and let's move on.